Hello there. This is Dr. Dan Guerra with another stimulating episode from Vereb Med. Um, we've been talking for the last several episodes on aging, and I want to continue, of course, that arc because I promised I was going to be talking about DNA repair. Right now, we're starting to get into more of the detail about what might be the potential mechanisms, the underlying cellular physiological, biochemical, genetic mechanisms that are actually responsible for aging in living systems. So last time, if you, pay, if you watched, we were talking about organic chemical reactions and how they occur in cells and how they may contribute directly or perhaps indirectly to senescence, that is, the aging process. Today, we're going to talk about um, DNA repair and how DNA repair um, has a very important function of maintaining the genome throughout the lifespan of a cell or a tissue, an organ or an organism. But eventually we're going to come back and we're going to discuss how DNA repair itself can facilitate a more rapid increase in aging because DNA repair involves necessarily opening up the chromatin, which is the DNA and protein in the nucleus. And in so doing, it opens it to the potential for adding new mutations. So we have to cover both how repair works in the normal physiological sense, and then we have to talk about how repair can go wrong when senescence occurs, and indeed how repair continues to function, even sometimes in the midst of making errors all of which then contribute to longevity, but also ultimately perhaps the demise at a specific age. So let's get started. Again, we're Vera Med, Dan Guerra here. And my presentation will look like this today. All right, so we're uh, filming this in late, well, actually uh, mid-July 2017. By the time it gets posted, it might be a little bit later. And the general topic here is aging correlated to genome instability. So obviously, we're going to have to make some definitions here. We have to define what we mean by genome and instability. And we've done it in the past, but we'll do it again today. So let's get started with that. So as a general introduction, this comes from a paper published around four years ago now in the Annual Review of Physiology. And we're just going to take a look at what I said here. What, what the paper tells us is that genome instability is linked to aging. It results from an alteration in gene expression as induced by mutation. The mutations themselves can then trigger a DNA chromatin repair. However, that repair process, um, it being very useful, in fact, necessary to maintain the genome, ultimately can also be corrupted itself, the repair mechanism corrupted, and that can induce further mutation. Okay. So I made this little um, cartoon here. One of the concepts we have with genomes, with actually all of life, is that it is um, in inhering to plasticity. So plasticity means that it's malleable, it means that it responds to um, outside or internal um, modifications, signaling, uh, nutrient supply. And we know this, living systems are not a continuous thing like the machine I'm recording on. You don't plug it in, it stays on until you turn it off. Uh, it goes, uh, living systems go through cycles. They occur um, diurnally. They occur over longer periods of time. Sometimes they even occur in terms of cell cycle, much more rapid, like less than a day. And depending on the organism, the cell, the tissue type, you're going to have varying rates of cellular differentiation, development, and terminal differentiation. 
And yet, even when cells terminally differentiate, they have to express genes in the form of making proteins. And this is not a process that is either um, constant and um, non-malleable, nor is it completely uh, stochastic, that is random. It involves a higher order regulation, which necessitates the gene expression to be on some kind of program determinant interval, but which must be modifiable on a moment's notice, hence the plasticity. So the organism doesn't know, so like say a human uh, where we evolved from, you know, a million, two million years ago, people that were foraging didn't know when they would get their next meal. So the body had to adapt to eating, gorging on a lot of food, say killing an animal and eating it, and then maybe not eating again for several days, particularly before there was such a thing as the invention of fire, right? So that means that it is an episodic uh, process at best, again, requiring plasticity. That is, the organism has to respond to changes that happen uh, just because it's a living system. So because of that plasticity, you have life, but also because of that plasticity, you introduce vulnerability. So here I'm showing you the vulnerability can include itself, DNA damage repair, that's DDR, telomere shortening. Remember the telomeres are those extensions of the chromosomes. They're extensions of DNA on the chromosomes and telomeres get shortened as cells go through replication cycles. And there's a certain limit to how many times a cell can reproduce itself, that is, that is replicate, before the telomeres get so short that it introduces a tremendous amount of mutation to the fidelity of the DNA replication machinery. And that cell then is programmed to either senesce which means it stops dividing for sure. It also slows down its metabolic activity. And then ultimately, of course, that senescence leads to cell death, necrosis, right? So telomere shortening is something like setting a clock, right? And that clock is ticking away. And eventually if it's run on say a battery, that clock will tick right out. That's how telomere shortening is considered. Now it's more complicated than that. And um, sometime I'll go give a lecture just on telomeres because they're really fascinating. But for, for now, I think that's adequate. But that can have an effect on plasticity, as you might guess. Plasticity meaning it's going to, because the cell replication cycle is plastic, shortening that telomere is going to alter that plasticity because you're no longer going to have the high fidelity that is the good level of DNA replication so that the next sister cell that's produced or daughter cell that's produced is going to have exactly the same genomic makeup as the one that it came from. Right? So telomere shortening will affect that. Therefore, it's impacting on this plasticity, leading to, as you can see there, instability. What else leads to instability? Of course, your, your standard bad players, radiation of any kind. That includes, of course, radiation from the sun, which is most of the radiation or all the radiation we really get, except for radioactive decay, which actually also ultimately came from the sun. But radiation in terms of UV light in particular um, can have a tremendous effect on this plasticity leading to genome instability. Um, xenobiotics, by that I mean any organic compound or even inorganic compound. If it's not a xenobiotic, it could still be a xenochemical that it causes some damage to the genome or some other kinds of physical, chemical, or biological damage to the cell so that the plasticity is converted into instability at the genomic level. And of course, our old friend, reactive oxygen species, or ROS. So we go from plasticity, which is a good thing, which is a necessary and universal aspect of life, to instability, which leaves the cell or leaves the, the tissue or the organ or the organism in a metastable state. It is not in the best situation possible, but it's not necessarily a deleterious position. An unstable state can get a new order, and that new order will be a new level of stability. It'll still have to be plastic because it's a living system, but you won't necessarily incur any 
tremendous cellular damage caused because of it. it. Just depends on the level of instability, of course, the quality of it. That's what's going on with the instability. So it's complicated, like everything in biology is. But instability will turn on DDR. Now, DDR, again, is DNA damage repair. And I put that little M there because I'm saying that if you have an unstable genome, and because of that, you have to carry out a lot of DNA repair, the DNA repair process itself, because it's getting used a lot, right? It's getting used a great deal. Like, so let's say you, were, you um, were a mechanic and you use your wrenches to fix, you know, cars. Well, those wrenches eventually wear out, right? Eventually, the wrench no longer grips that uh, uh, hex nut, and you have to get new wrenches. They get smoothed out. What's well, the similar thing with enzymes? And enzymes are involved in DDR, right? You can just imagine any kind of enzymes. In fact, we're going to see what they are. So when I put the M there, I'm saying that that's a mutated DDR or modified, if you like. So the DDR no longer is actually faithfully repairing the genome, it's actually introducing more instability. It could still be repairing, but at the same time, it's carrying with it baggage you don't want. Okay? So that's why I put the M in front of it. Now, what that will lead to in this, like, this is a negative paradigm here, <laughs> you get what I call iotrogenic hyperinstability. Iotrogenic is a fancy word. All it means is it's caused by the therapy, right? caused by whatever the treatment is. Treatment here is DDR, that is DNA damage repair. So it's a term I kind of made up, but I like it because I think it explains what's going on. And I'm calling it hyperinstability because it's not just an unstable system, it's an extremely unstable system because you're introducing constantly the opportunity, the ability to make more mutations. So it's hyper unstable. So the state is hyper instability. Ultimately, then, with this model that we can we can at least entertain as a possibility, which causes aging, or that is cellular senescence, that iotrogenic hyperinstability leads to senescence. This is one model, one theory that we can again entertain and explore. So now I'm going to walk away from that DNA repair thing for a moment, but not really. I'm going to try to show you by focusing back out, taking the lens back out of that one very discrete thing, DNA repair. And I realize I haven't gone into detail with it, but I will very soon. But I want you to think about the nucleus itself. And remember I said you can have physical, chemical, or biological corruption I'm going from you know that plasticity to that instability. Well, the physical corruption could just be the actual structure of the nucleus. Remember, that's where the chromatin is in the eukaryote. So there are proteins called lamins, and it's published here in Molecular Cellular Biology a couple of years ago. They're looking at lamins, and they tell us that lamins are associated with the structure of the nucleus. They're structural proteins, right? Kind of like the scaffolding proteins that you make, that you need to make a frame, right? So it was demonstrated that the reduction that is decreasing the amount of nuclear nuclear uh, um, expressed lamin B1. So the protein is actually nuclear uh, located. Okay. When you reduce the amount of lamin B1, it's just a certain isoform via using a synthetic method. And a synthetic method is short hairpin RNA silencing. If you don't know that system, if it sounds really complicated or it sounds weird, really all it is is making um, RNA molecules, which have um, sequence homology to messenger RNA, which codes for protein. And it's a short hairpin because it's kind of what the structure looks like. It's like what a hairpin looks like, like a loop, but it's not a, it doesn't have a lot of nucleotides. It only has a very small number of nucleotides. But that hairpin allows this shRNA to, because of sequence homology, to bind to a messenger RNA and flummox it, cause it to no longer be expressed, can't be translated. So the short hairpin RNA is just a molecular tool, like so many we use in the lab, that allows us to silence genes. Why do we want to silence genes? Because we want to see what the genes really are doing. 
Okay. So we know what their sequence is. We know what the proteins are supposed to do, but you know, there, it, there's a whole lot of pleiotropy in proteins. They do one thing and you're following what they do, like say they're an enzyme, but that same enzyme could have four or five other functions, which could otherwise be a cult until you start monkeying with it, start altering its activity. And all of a sudden you say, wow, look, this protein does a lot of other things. So that's why you use something like a short hairpin RNA as a molecular tool. Okay, so when they use that to silence this lamin expression, great thing, great news, it stalled cancer cell cycle in the early S, that's the synthetic phase, that's DNA replication phase. And, it, and they determine that that happens because during DNA replication, there's something called a DNA replication fork, Okay, that's where nation DNA is being made. So you can make um, a daughter strand of the DNA that started out, the diplo DNA. You open up, you have two strands, and you make daughter strands on there. So you have replication forks because the DNA opens up, makes a fork in the road. Well, when you decrease this lamin B1 production using shRNA, those replication forks fail to assemble. So obviously, what's that going to do? It's going to stop the cell from cycling. And you're not going to make a cell divide because you can't replicate the genome. See? Now, for cancer cells, that is downright cool because we're always looking for drugs to kill cancer cells. Wow. So reducing this protein, if you can do it, and you know, you could use short hairpin RNA, kind of clunky way of doing things in vivo, but you might think about making, like for example, a monoclonal antibody to lamin B1. If you could target that to cancer cells, look what happens. Huh. You stall the cancer cell cycle, which means that they no longer can reproduce, which means goodbye cancer. All right. So that's kind of like a, you know, a translational medicine reason why this is interesting, not just basic research. But it's always the case. It's always some idea you can get from basic research. Anyway, so double-stranded DNA breaks from that replication for collapse. And when that happens, they are it can be repaired, okay? So introducing this lamin-induced replication for collapse means that you have to induce the DDR. Now, DDR in this system has a particular kind of mechanism, and that mechanism that they're looking at is either non-homologous end joining or homologous recombination repair. Now, don't worry about that if you don't know what it means. It's a mouthful, but I will show you the mechanism carefully and discreetly, not in tonight's lecture, but in a subsequent one, and it will no longer seem unusual or weird or scary. Okay? It's just a, a mechanism that goes on with DNA metabolism. Look at it that way, just a macromolecular metabolic pathway. And this particular use of it is a repair mechanism. Anyway, using the homologous recombination DDR repair, we notice that it becomes corrupted. That particular mechanism is corrupted when lamin B1 is reduced. So not only, I mean, do you got this like cell cycle arrest, like that's like the big you know, pulling the camera out or getting up at 20,000 feet on top of a mountain to take a look at what's going on. But when you get down in the valley and say, well, what's really going on? Well, wow, this DDR isn't working. Okay. So that's kind of really cool because if that's not working, if you're not getting repair, you see, then you're do, inducing, introducing so many mutations that DNA, it can't carry out, this fidelity gets shot down, can't carry out replication. So the cell dies. If it's a cancer cell, groovy. That's exactly what you want. Sorry, I use the word groovy. I don't normally use it. it. Just came out. Anyway, this little bit of information. Okay, now the paper is elegant and excellent. I'm just, you know, synthesizing a few things about it here because I'm trying to make a point. But anyways, what the point is that this this paper here suggests that maintenance of this protein, this structural protein, lamin B1, is required for DNA replication and repair through the regulation of expression of key factors involved in those essential nuclear functions. So not only is lamin this structural protein, which seems kind of boring, right? It's like the girders or, you know, or the, or the structure for the house to build it, right? The framing of the house, it's that. But also when you corrupt that a little bit, look what goes on. No longer you carry out non-homologous 
joining or homologous recombination mediated DDR. So what happens to the cell? It's gone. Can't repair itself, dies quickly. Cancer cell, that's exactly good. If it's a healthy cell, whoa, that's not good, right? Because if you can't divide, um, you're only going to have a certain lifespan. And that certain lifespan of that cell, once it's done, it's done. If you can't replace that cell, eventually you'll have less cells in that tissue, less cells in that tissue, less function that that tissue performed, less function, eventually you can get organ failure. And then, well, what does that mean? Senescence, right? No longer doing what's supposed to do. And then ultimately death. Right? Okay. So that, see, it brings it back, right? So you're thinking, lamb, and how does that have to do with anything with DDR? Well, it does, apparently. Okay? So here's another case in point, the pleiotropy of a protein. Lamb and B1 somehow is affecting DNA replication. So who would have known, right? But here we go. We got evidence for it. So that's something I want you to keep in mind whenever we talk about any players or any proteins here. So... <clears throat> We know that genome instability is a physiological consequence of basal chromatin plasticity, as I've just been saying. And along with that is the remodeling of chromatin. Remodeling just means opening up that uh, chromatin DNA so that you can replicate it, you can recombine it, or you can transcribe it. That's what remodeling means. I have not the kind of word I would have used. Somebody came up with it, they liked it, and there it is, right? I don't see DNA or chromatin like you know remodeling a kitchen or a house, but somebody obviously did. So there's the, there's the terminology, like it or not. Anyway, both plasticity and remodeling kind of work hand in hand. And they're coupled with chronic DNA damage. So this instability you get, okay, is because you have plasticity. And plasticity, a component of that is remodeling. So you have a, you know, a thriving living cell and it has these normal features to it. But all of that can lead to chronic DNA damage. So what do I mean? Saying it again, physical, chemical, biological destruction of chromatin DNA. Chromatin DNA means DNA associated with chromatin, which means there's proteins involved. You get cohering, mutational, and epimutational consequences of this damage. That means when you get the damage, something coheres with it. That's what I mean by cohering, right? And what's cohering is a mutational system is brought in, right? because of this damage repair. So that results in more unstable chromatin DNA structure. And that means the DNA damage repair mediates in this model system, chromatin disorganization. Okay. So what is DNA damage repair mutations? Where do they all come together? So let's define it. Damage is defined as deviations from the normal chemical structure of DNA. And that is distinct in a way from direct mutations. So mutations, when you use the word mutation, that's a functional term, if you will. So mutation is still damage, of course, right? But when you say mutation, it means you're altering the sequence. And what, you know, that reads out to, pun intended, the information content, right? The information content the DNA sequence has in it. Right. Okay. So DNA damage can involve spontaneous hydrolysis of the sugar phosphate backbone, for example. That can involve then alteration of the nucleotides or actually the nucleotide bases themselves. So that can involve depurination and depyrimidination. Now, pyrimidines are two different types of nucleotides, specifically C and T, and purines are the other two nucleotides. Maybe we only have four, and those are A and G, or adenine and guanosine. Okay? Guanine. Okay, so... That's an important thing to keep in mind. Spontaneous hydrolysis can occur and you can remove bases. And that's what happens there. You can also get oxidation from ROS, for example. And that can, of course, involve all kinds of unusual chemical modifications of the DNA. I say myriad different chemical lesions. Sounds cool. So there are exogenous sources of this damage, which we mentioned already. Radiation, like UV light and ionizing radiation, not something you normally get, that ionizing radiation, but you can if you go to get a scan, for example. Um, but there are also a host of environmental mutagens, which can be called xenobiotics if they're biological in origin. Uh, DNA repair mechanisms, which involve genome maintenance, right, taking care of business, keeping that genome maintained, are, of course, highly conserved in all eukaryotes and, in fact, in prokaryotes. 
And they are always continuously surveilling, monitoring the genome for DNA damage. They're responsible for the high level of genome integrity that we enjoy for all of ourselves under though normal physiological conditions. Now, what happens during aging that is senescence of the cell? You're no longer in that normal physiological range. You're starting to push a little bit out of it, right? It's like when a car gets older and older, more and more things break down, right? First it's the starter. Well, before that, it's like the battery and the tires and the brakes. Then it's the starter, or maybe it's the radiator, or maybe it's uh, the head gasket, right? And on and on and on until finally there's so many things wrong with that car. Well, you probably you have to either spend a fortune getting it all repaired or you get a new one, right? You can't get a new body. So what happens with the body is it starts shutting down. And a biological system is way more complex than an automobile because it's living as it's carrying out its own decay. And it's trying to stay alive, but doing so in a, I would say, a reserved way, even though it's plastic. It knows it's going to die. The system doesn't know like we know things. But the system is set up so that it it is prepared to deal with the ultimate senescence and indeed, yes, death of the cells, the cell, the tissues and the organism. Now, when genome maintenance fails, okay, that can lead to sequence modification. And it can also lead to other kinds of changes, which we call epigenetic, which are covalent modifications of either the cohering proteins like the histones methylating them, acetylating them, ubiquitinylating them, or, of course, direct methylation of cytosine residues in DNA. Those are epigenetic modifications, not direct sequence modifications, modifications that can lead to changes in gene expression. So let's now talk about frank DNA repair systems. There are ultimate types. There's the more ancient um, DNA polymerase proofreading, so when you're making new DNA, right, when you're replicating the genome, there's an enzyme called DNA polymerase, which actually proofreads, that is, it checks what its work, okay? Like when you proofread something, when you've written something, or you have a proofread checker or a spell checker on your computer, which I actually always shut off. I don't know why, I guess it's just, I like making mistakes. Uh, anyway, there is a DNA polymerase that proofreads, but that, you know, has pretty high fidelity, but that has nothing to do with when we have to go in and do damage repair, right? It's different, there's more involved now. So what are the general mechanisms of repair? There's direct repair, like in primitive dimers. That's like, for example, caused by UV light. I'm not going to cover that today. That's well described in the literature, well described in textbooks, and even probably all over the internet. I'm just not going to talk about it. I want to talk today first about base excision repair, and then I'm going to eventually lead to nucleotide mismatch excision repair, and then the granddaddy of them, the double strand break repair, the non homologous ascend joining and recombination, the really sophisticated stuff, right? So right now we're going to start off easy, and I bet you probably won't think it's easy, but it is. It's called base excision repair, so let's do it. I just love this slide. It took me a while to find this particular diagram. I told you I like chemicals because I'm a biochemist. So I hate when they just show like boxes. This shows you, you know, ribo sugars and ribose phosphates. And it didn't show you the base, but that probably would have been too much detail. Anyways, take a look at this. First of all, I want to acknowledge paper comes from a publication in uh, Cold Spring Harbor Perspectives Bio of Biology in 2013. Okay, Citation, it's actually available online like all, I think, Cold Spring Harbor uh, publications are. Let's take a look. Here is your regular DNA, but notice here it's got this, I'm sorry about this, how, how small it looks, but it had to fit on a slide. It's got this little asterisk by this base. That means this base, as, as it stands in this here slide, has already ha incorporated a lesion, means some kind of alteration chemically to that base. Okay? Now, you have to get rid of it, right? We're doing DNA damage repair, so you got to get rid of that. So what happens is there's a wonderful system that starts off with DNA glycosylases. And what that does, because you've got this ribosugar here, and that's a glycosidic linkage, that ribosugar to the nucleotide base, you have an enzyme called a glycosylase, which removes the base. Boom, it's gone, see? Now that ribosugar just has a free hydroxyl group. It used to have something like A, G, C, or T there. 
So you got this DNA. You got rid of the, the bad player. The base was corrupted somehow. It was chemically modified. You eliminated it. Now there's a couple of different ways you can continue the process. You can use an enzyme called AP lipase. Lyase, excuse me. And what AP lyase does it either, okay, let's get rid of the entire ribose sugar, or it leaves the ribose sugar, but it cleaves this bond here, right? So now you cleave that bond there. So now you have a... Um, phosphate here and you still have a sugar phosphate on this three prime end that's the new five prime end that's the new three prime end on this leading strand yeah. or if you remove the entire sugar you now have two groups here see you have completely removed it now you have two ends you have a five fresh hydroxyl uh, you can now add a nucleotide directly to this hydroxyl group or this hydroxyl group okay? as as coming incomings are always coming in as deoxy NTPs that is deoxynucleotide triphosphates. Drives a reaction of DNA replication is that you strip off those last two phosphates, the alpha and the beta, just like if you're taking ATP to AMP, that drives the reaction because of PPI hydrolysis to 2PI. Uh, and ultimately, you get a covalent bond formed, okay? And th these hydroxyl groups will serve as the uh, substrate for the addition of the incoming nucleotides. So you either got that, so this is ready to go, basically, or you've still got this ribose here. Or another way, using the APE enzyme, you see what we've done here is that we've broken this bond over here. So we've opened up this three prime end. We still have this phos sugar phosphate here. We still have a phosphate here. So you got more work to do. So three different possible ways. They come down to only one final product. So either polymerase B or AP1 or PNKP. Ultimately, you remove a phosphate or you remove this entire See this entire ribose phosphate, okay? You end up now with a hydroxyl group at the three prime end of this new end, and you still have a phosphate here at this new five prime end. Now you're ready to go. You come in with a deoxy NTP, because you want this phosphate to be here. You come in with the deoxy NPP, that's a deoxy nucleotide triphosphate, using the polymerase, you start adding nucleotide. See, you're adding back. You strip that guy out, now you gotta add back, and this one presumably is the good guy. And by the way, it's added as a complement to whatever this sequence is saying. So if you, if you had a corrupted G, you want to add back a G, so the nucleotide that's going to be opposing it on this strand is going to be what? Well, of course, it's going to be C, right? G, C, A, T base pairing. Right? All right. Anyways, you got to ligate that now. That means you have to, like, make this close this bond here, right? And that ligation then, now you're back to where you were. Now, we call that short patch basic decision repair, short because only one nucleotide shown here. Now, same kind of thing goes down if you have a whole bunch of corrupted nucleotides, which you're supposed to be looking at here, okay, because you could obviously imagine you could have a bunch of nucleotides that have been mutated. But here, of all these enzymes come together, kind of like a polyprotein, polyenzymatic process, so that in new enzymes have to be used for this process, but you add in, in like oligonucleotides, and you're able to add all of the ruined nucleotides, all those mistakes, you add them back as a oligonucleotide, and you still end up with still back to where you were, a repaired genome. We just call that long patch because it's a longer patch of nucleotides. And it has different enzymes. Who would know that you would have had both of these mechanisms and all this detail? Well, now we do. So that's what all this says. Okay, you don't need to go through it, but there are five core steps, excision, incision, end processing. It's like polishing the sends so they become um, able to receive the incoming nucleotide. Then you get the repair synthesis. You actually get the introduction of the deoxy NTP. And then you got to fill that in and, and ligate it. You have to close that wound, and now it's ready to go, and that genome should be fine. So that is um, base excision repair. Okay, I like this slide. And sorry it's small. Now, let's... Think about this now. Let's go back to some generic understandings. Since react reactive oxygen are chemically reactive, the oxidation can lead to all kinds of things, protein degradation, lipid degradation, of course, DNA-based lesions. It's one of the things reactive oxygen does. That's why antioxidants are used, okay, why they're produced in the cell. So those kind of lesions, those oxidized DNA lesions, will result in structural changes to the DNA and that means it has to be repaired, just like we just did, okay? And we, we did it with basic system repair. 
Now, what is one uh, example of that? Well, one is when you get a ring atom purine oxidation. So one of the atoms in the ring of that purine, this is going to be guanine, gets oxidized. And when it gets oxidized, you got problems because that means it's no longer the same chemical. So that means it's no longer the exact same nucleotide base, purine base in this case. So it's going to be potentially mutagenic. So that guanine derivative has a very special name, and we see it a lot in mutational analysis. It's called 7-8-dihydro-8-oxoguanine, or short 8-oxo-G. Okay? So that is a mutated guanine in the nucleotide. Okay? In the DNA, if it's incorporated into the, into the DNA. Now, the 8-oxo-G lesion results in DNA polymerase-mediated insertion of an adenine opposite to that 8-oxo-G. Now, think about this. You had a G there, right? Good. G got corrupted, so you want to do something with that G. Okay, good. So you're going to want to get rid of it like we just did. We showed you how basic change repair could do that. But, whoa, wait a minute. It's going to go, and it's going to do – it's going to insert – an adenine opposite that. Now, is that right? Well, no, because G pairs with not A, but with C. So see, you've already changed the sequence. You've made a point mutation, basically. And it's a specific kind, a transitional one, which I'll show you. All right. Now, that results in a disruption of DNA sequence. That may or may not have any effect. The sequence of that piece of DNA does not code for a protein, does not involve an enhancer element or a promoter or a termination signal or otherwise a um, site on the DNA that acts to receive a transcription factor. Okay. Then it might not matter. But enough of these lesions, and of course not going to happen just one at a time, but thousands can happen then you're going to corrupt that DNA, you're going to, and you're going to make it unstable. And that's what we're talking about here. So it results in disruption of DNA sequence, and depending on the frequency, that's I mean, how often, chronicity, when it happens in the cell cycle, and where it is, very important, like if it's in smack dab in the middle of a gene or not, so in situ local, location or localization, can cause dramatic phenotypic effects in somatic cells. In fact, can cause the cells to die, go through programmed cell death, kill themselves, they could look uh, toxic to the uh, immune uh, surveillance system, and the immune system goes in and kills it. T cells can kill it. Macrophages can go in and destroy it, um, chew it up. Neutrophils, um, B cells can generate, uh, or ma um, plasma cells can generate antibodies. The whole shooting match of immune responses can occur to that cell type. But also, you can simply just get senescence, right? If the cell has been damaged in some way, can't replicate, it's lost its fidelity. It's not ready to kill itself. It's not ready to be killed by the immune system. It's not toxic enough for that. So basically it stops replicating, slows down, much less protein synthesis in its function because of that starts to fall away, it ages, if you will. So let's take a look at the repair of an 8-oxo G. I'm going to just have asterisk G here. Uh, for simplicity in this diagram. Now, this diagram, once again, borrowed it from the literature, of course. And this comes from a paper in Cold Spring Harbor, Perspectives in Biology, another 2013 paper, as it turns out. And again, this paper, I'm pretty sure, is um, uh, available online, uh, open access, I mean. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I realize it's getting dark, and you may no longer see my image, and I could turn on the light, but I'm so excited, I don't want to get up from the desk right now. So let's take a look at this. Two possible ways you can get that corrupted guanine. One is you can just have the deoxy GTP. Remember, this is the substrate for DNA replication. So one substrate, it's the guanine substrate. Reacts with reactive oxygen, and you make that 8 oxo G right there. That's the substrate that before you even get it into the DNA. Now, if that happens and it gets incorporated because of replication, gets paired with A, which is not correct, right? Because that's supposed to be a T with an A. But you can repair it. So that whole process we just looked at here, this is a repair system. That MYH is, one, is the initial enzyme. That's the glycosylase. Okay, see? The AUG protein and the MYH are both human DNA glycosylases. They got those names. 
You repair it though, and look what happens. The repair yields a mutation, okay? Because you had a TA, you went to a GA, doesn't work. And so what happens is the G uh, um, now pairs back to a C. But you went from a TA to a GC. That's a mutation, right? So here you got a repair process that introduced a mutation in the process of trying to repair. That's no good. All right. Now, fortunately, there's an enzyme called MTH1. Now, that is a really beautiful name. 8-oxo-7-8-dihydrodeoxyguanosine triphosphatase. And what that enzyme does, it hydrolyzes that 8-oxo-GTP, deoxy-GTP, to 8-oxo-deoxy-GMP. And boy, you know what? That is not a substrate for DNA polymerase. So it's no good. It, it, no worry. I mean, you eliminated it. That enzyme, when it's active, way cool. You got rid of this damaged nucleotide precursor for DNA synthesis, and it never gets in there. Okay, so that's good. Now, what happens when you have the oxidation right in the DNA? Okay, the more, you know, equally or probably more common because the DNA is this huge macromolecule the nucleus. So reactive oxygen again, we're going to use him as the bad player. You introduce this uh, 8-oxo-G right into now. This is in the DNA. You go through the repair process. That's the glycosylase reaction, right? And now you've got this G incorporated in there. Okay, that's a good thing. This this uh, mutated form can also replicate, right? And if it replicates, so if, if you didn't repair it like this with this glycosylase system, you replicate first. You're going to make this mistake, right? You're going to be adding A there. It's going to want to add that add to it, add an adenine there. Not supposed to be there, but this doesn't look like guanine anymore, you see. It's corrupted. However, still, you can go through the repair process, starting off with the glycosylase, and you're back to this. You still have that mutation, but you still have the correct uh, nucleotide base pair. However, if you replicate with the A in it, you get another mutation, see? So you can either have a GC mutation from a TA, or you can have a TA mutation, okay? from a GC. So either way, okay, either way, it depends on what side of the chromatin you're on, either way from when you have a, an alteration of the axion TPs or when you have oxidation of DNA, you're going to end up with a TA here and you had before a GC. So what we call that is a transitional point mutation. It's a transition because it, it gave you, it goes from GC to, AT, to TA, okay? So that's a problem, right? All right, now, cancers are characterized, of course, by ROS-mediated DNA and deoxy-NTP oxidation. So that's how they get started, right? So you know this is going on. So the MTH1 protein eliminates the oxidized DNTP, preventing misincorporation. That's what you want. So, and, but, but the deal is, because you have those different pathways I just showed you, MTH is actually non-essential in normal cells because you have multiple ways of dealing with this. Because you got a repair system. You have a DDR. There's, you have a BER DDR. Okay. So, MTH1 is non-essential. It means that you can knock that out and it, your cells are still okay. Okay. So, what's really cool, though, is cancer cells need MTH1. Host cells don't, cancer cells do, because they want to avoid the incorporation of all that oxidized deoxy NTP, because there's a lot more of it in the cancer cell. Cancer cell thrives on mutation to start out, but the more mutations it picks up, it's going to kill it, right? It can't replicate anymore. And that's kind of what you want. Once the cancer cell starts proliferating, dividing, the sooner you can stop it from proliferating, the better, because if you just kill that cell lineage, that mutated cell lineage, that oncogenic cell lineage, that's what you want to happen. You stop it from becoming, for example, metastatic or invasive even. Okay. So inhibitors of MTH1 allow incorporation of oxidized NTPs into cancer cells. So if you inhibit that enzyme and you target that inhibitor to the cancer cell, it does, and even you don't have to because even if you eliminate or you intoxicate all the MTH, People, person might show some signs from some intoxication, but you're not going to die from it because MTH1 is non-essential. So it selectively kills the cancer cells. 
So misincorporation damages DNA, and that results in cytotoxic cancer ablation. And that's a good thing. Right, here's another translational medical nugget. Now looking at MTH, before it was the lamin, right? The lamin B1, we looked at that. Maybe make it a monoclone to that. Now we're talking about MTH1. This was in a paper published in Nature. Uh, again, well, it was 2014, so about three years ago. And that's the citation. Nature, so it's behind the paywall. You'd have to have access to it to be able to read it. Okay, now let's get to a more important question here. Okay, we know that there are multiple types of DDR, DNA damage repair. I just went through just one of them, the simplest one, basic scission repair. So now we could ask the question, where is BER most prominent when you're doing DDR? Well, I, went, I didn't know that. I didn't know the exact answer to that. I had some ideas, but I found a paper. And the paper was in a journal called Mitochondrian. Who would know there's a journal called Mitochondrian? There is, and it's actually an excellent journal. And thank God uh, I was able to find, get a copy of this. So it's in 2014 paper. What does this paper tell us? This is very interesting. Key repair and, uh, mechanism in the central nervous system is BER. Now, why would that be? Because you got these other repair mechanisms, right? It's because recombination replication DDR mechanisms are not very robust in neurons. Why? Because neurons are terminally differentiated cells. I'm sure you've all heard this before. You get a, you get, you lose a lot of neurons. You're not really going to get them back, buddy, right? So, you know, you get hypoxia or you get anoxia in the brain for a couple of minutes. You get brain dead, right? Okay, well, that's why. Because you don't get neurogenesis. You get some new neurogenesis. Okay, that's been shown that the hippocampus is support that. But those new neurons, they are not... Um, pruned and tailored, that is the dendritic spines and the exon length have not been manufactured and altered in a way so that they will automatically replace neurons that already have been in place for a very long period of time, thank you, generating those synapses, those trillions of synapses, which makes the brain what the brain is and whatever level the brain translates to how the mind works. Right? Okay, so even if you might get neurogenesis, which is actually pretty paltry, uh, but has been shown to occur in some hippocampus. Um, doesn't matter. If you lose neurons, it's bad, right? All right, so that means neurons don't divide much. They, they, they stay around a long time. So that kind of repair process doesn't work. So instead of that, in your brain, BER is the main game. That's the point. Now that leads to some interesting sequelae, where BER activity decreases then, Damage can exceed repair, of course, and that's characteristic, uh-oh, in aging cells. It can result in programmed cell death, like apoptosis. It can result in senescence. That means the kicking back, lying back, lying down, aging of the cell. Or it can actually increase mutagenesis. Why? Because your BER activities decrease. You're not, you're not fixing things. You're not fixing all those damaged bases in the brain. And since that's your only game in town or your main game in town in the brain, you lose that with aging. So that activity slows down. You lose that activity just by the chronicity of cell aging and probably also by overuse of it because of, say, damage inflicted episodically to the brain. And that, of course, would be the vagaries of the individual involved, right? Yeah. So BR is therefore critically protective of neurons. That's where it's really important. It operates in the nucleus, and presumably, though, here's a new idea, it also may operate in the mitochondria. Now, the mitochondria, as you know, is its own genome. I mentioned it many times in these talks and today, in fact. So BER works in both those organelles, although there's a twist here. Now, what's the twist? Even though neurons are terminally differentiated, mitochondrial replication that works by autonomous fission. So mitochondria replicate by fission, like bacteria. Weird, right? So the mitochondria go through their own cycles in a cell. You can have many, many mitochondria in a cell that has a lot of oxidative metabolism. 
But when oxidative metabolism decreases because of, say, damage caused by reactive oxygen or because of aging, for example, or all kinds of other reasons, fuel economy, what fuels there, fatty acid versus glucose in particular, you can lose mitochondria by mitophagy. It just means the, the mit mitochondria are eaten up. That's what phagus means, to eat, right? So mitophagy, in fact, they, they kind of like um, turn inside out and disappear. So less and less mitochondria happen. But also mitochondria are reproduced by fission. And that happens when you have more and more oxidative metabolism. You need more mitochondria, basically. Only other organelle that does it is the peroxisome. And I know I mentioned the peroxisome on my uh, Facebook. I'm going to deal with peroxisomes in this uh, arc of uh, aging you know, subsequently. But anyways, those are the two organelles, mitochondria and peroxisomes, autonomously replicate in the cell. They're not set with cell cycle. Interesting, right? All right. But the peroxisome, by the way, doesn't have any genome. So unique for mitochondria. All right. So that suggests that my recombination repair might be more important um, and maybe autonomously functioning in neural mitochondrial DNA repair, while the neural nuclear DNA repair is dominated by basic tissue repair. So see, like even within one cell, there's a division of labor. Nucleus, because the nucleus is terminally differentiated, so recombination isn't so, the genes that are involved in recombination and replication aren't there because you're not recombining and replicating there because those neurons are terminally differentiated, not something those cells are supposed to be doing, right? If they do, what do you get? Well, not a neuron, but if it happens in the um, glia, you get glioblastoma, right? Not good, brain tumor, right? All right, anyway, so that's an interesting thing. You have maybe recombination repair dominant in the mitochondria and in, in the neuron, but you have basic excision repair dominant in the, in the um, nucleus of the neuron. That's a potential pharmacological targeting mechanism. Think about it. Now, here we go. Pretty important translational stuff here. Neurodegeneration implications. In both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, some reports that I've looked at suggest that a 50% reduction in mitochondrial DNA is apparent in those neurons. That's a big whopping decrease in DNA content, mitochondrial DNA content. Yeah. Now, if you're losing mitochondrial DNA content, it means you have less mitochondria. But in order to have less mitochondria, or once you had more, that means you have to go through this mitophagy. When you go through mitophagy, what happens? You cause basically a disintegration of the mitochondria. Disintegration of mitochondria means you're going to lose, first of all, all the biological activity that mitochondria has, but something else is going to be generated. Toxicant products, we'll call them for this point from right now, but in a minute, I'll, you'll see what they are. So mitochondrial DNA decrease would then diminish outright, frankly, the electrotransport chain oxidative phosphorylation delivery of ATP, delivery meaning what it produces. That's going to lead to senescence or cell death. If those cells don't have enough ATP, they can't carry out the normal function. They're going to go senescing. And if they still have less and less and less, they will die. Right? So you get senescence, necrosis of what? Neurons. Not good, right? And that's all wrapped up because of mitochondrial DNA, right? Decreasing, which means that the mitochondrial, the number of them is decreasing. Now, that is because of mitophagy, as I say, indicated by a net decrease in mitochondrial DNA, because DNA is chewed up once you have mitophagy. And so the, what else happens because you're de de demolishing mitochondria? Remember, mitochondria have all of these intermembrane proteins that are involved in the electron transport chain. And what are those proteins? There are a bunch of oxidases, cytochrome containing, heme containing oxidases. What do they have in them? To be a heme, be a good, healthy heme. They have metals, right, in the porphyrin ring. What are the metals? Iron and copper. So when you're when you're going along, you know, bagging, destroying your mitochondria, right? When the mitochondria are de decreasing in uh, content, less of them and less of them in those neurons, right? Less and less energy production. Uh, what happens also is you're releasing a lot of copper and iron. Now, free, even submicromolar. CU2, 
That's the oxidation state of Cu. That's cupric ions. And iron, either as ferrous or ferric, strongly inhibit DNA glycosylases. Just those metal ions. Okay? Those species of them which are going to be increased because of mito mitophagy, mitochondrial degradation, right? So if they inhibit DNA glycosylases, they will inhibit BA BER. You won't, in other words, the, the basic condition repair won't work. Remember, the glycosylases are like front and center, the enzyme that starts the whole process. So you don't, you get a decrease in basic condition repair mediated DDR, the DNA damage repair, in neurons in the aging brain. That is all really bad news. But you see how it correlates to AD and PD, that is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. We already know you get a decrease in mitochondrial DNA content. You're getting, you're getting a lower energy. That's already going to cause neuronal senescence and neuronal necrosis, that is death. But also, to add insult to injury, you're going to be inhibiting the very enzymes that will allow DNA repair for those cells that still have right a nucleus, the cells that are still thriving, all those other neurons. So you're going to start diminishing because of this ion, these ions being generated in, in, because they're going to start corrupting. <laughs> they're going to start corrupting nuclear DNA repair, you see, because that's where the BER matters. Bad news, right? So there are actually multiple reports on single nucleotide polymorphisms. That just means individual nucleotide like point mutations in BER enzymes in neurodegenerative diseases. Like that's even worse. That means that if you get a mutation in the coding region for the enzymes that are associated with basic condition repair, right, you're going to enhance this whole senescence necrosis effect in the brain, in those neurons. So what does that look like? That looks like a lot of our dementia-associated mainframe diseases, neuropsychiatric diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So you see? Another thing to worry about, or not worry about, another thing to be aware of, right? Sure. All right, so we're going to stop here. Hopefully, uh, you don't mind the fact that my image got really dark. Doesn't matter anyways. You, need, you don't need to look at me. Um, but I am Dan Guerra, and you just heard a lecture on basic decision repair involved in aging in humans. There's our email address, info at verifmed.com. Please, please contact me with questions or comments about this presentation, which will be posted eventually on YouTube or anything else. We really would like your input on these uh, free um, uh, to the public uh, lectures. And also, of course, we would very much like to work with you at Vera of Med for your particular research problem. There's our website. Please go to the website. We have a lot of beautiful things that you can look at there and you can see what we do in more detail. And remember that we are scientists. We're not medical doctors. We are scientists. And our work is to verify published evidence in medical and other biosciences. So thanks a lot for your attention and goodbye.